couple different domain names that we, we want to use. And um, so I don't know if anybody, if anybody wants to help us with that initiative, you know, just let, talk, to, talk to me afterwards or whatever, or you know, whatever. Um, you can always shoot me an email afterwards. That's fine too. Uh, if anybody has any in domain names that we can use. So, and, um, so uh, if anybody wants to help us with that initiative, you know, just a couple of questions. Talk to me afterwards or whatever. Go ahead. I don't know what's going on. Sorry about that. This makes it's going live, so. You good? You're good. All right, so yeah, so like I said, if anybody wants to help us with the with our own SSC website, really. And I have like a laundry list of features, so I have a pretty good, pretty good backlog already going for this. So, so we're definitely gonna, we're definitely not gonna do it as a big bang thing. It's gonna be a, um, we're gonna do this very agile as well. And um, especially if you know, we're having different people help us out as far as when they have time and stuff like that. So, it's just gonna have to be done in a kind of very good iterative approach, anyways. So, um, you know, like I said, if anybody wants to help, just talk to me afterwards. You get on shoot an email, just whatever, you know. So. We would greatly appreciate it. Um, you know, I, I personally also want to, want, to, want to thank our sponsors. You know, Tech Systems. And, you know, Tech Systems has, has, has really been an awesome sponsor for us. You know, always helping us out. You know, they they they've also you know personally helped me out as far as you know different different opportunities that, that I've been searching for. Um, and it's also like some some of, some of our other members as well. You know, they, they help land. Also, you know, personally helped me out as far as different different opportunities. You're killing me, man. Keep go ahead. Go ahead. Than a parrot. <laughs> <laughs> all right. mute on all of them. Is this what all the scrum's all about? <laughs> Echo, yeah. Uh, yeah, Echo. 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 All right, we're good. Echo. Echo. All right, so, um, yeah, so, you know, Tech Systems, obviously, you know, they, they've, they've been really awesome as far as, you know, helping, helping us, remember, our, our members, as well, myself, you know, help their different opportunities, stuff like that. Um, so, if, if you or someone you know is looking for an opportunity in the, in the software development field, you know, contact Stephanie or any, or any, any of the other um, tech systems people that help out. Um, you know, Rev3 has obviously been, been awesome with, you know, continually giving us this, this meeting space. And, um, you know, so, the, you know, this room's really awesome. So, you know, big, you know, I really appreciate, you know, Rev3 for everything that they've done. You know, Nick has been awesome. So, um, yeah, so, so first we're going to have um, Stephanie come up. She's going to talk about, you know, about tech systems and some opportunities that they have available. And then after that, Nick's gonna say some things about Rev3, and then um, after that, we Chris do his presentation. So, everything. Stop doing tech systems. Hi guys, um, I appreciate you having um, a sponsor. We definitely love coming out um, meeting. Normally, I have a few of my partners with me, just me today. But um, just want to say a few things about tech systems, um, how we can partner with you, whether you're looking now or in the future. Um, if you're not too familiar with tech systems, we're actually one of the leading IT service and staffing companies in the nation. Um, from a nation standpoint, we work with about 20, um, 25,000 consultants nationwide, partner with about 1,500 companies. Um, within the Chicagoland area, we have three offices, um, one downtown, one in the western suburbs, and one up north. Um, we make sure to partner with consultants, um, whether it be in the application space, the network infrastructure, and end user, end user support, or um, the telecommunication space. So I specifically recruit on Microsoft services, um, so whether that be SharePoint, SQL, or .NET. Um, we definitely have dedicated recruiters within that space um, and recruiters within all the spaces that I previously had mentioned. Um, in addition to that, definitely want to make sure that we are, you know, meeting people within the industry, um, not just helping you find, you know, your next career, but also being a point of contact for you when you're not looking because we realize, you know, there's less than, what, 1% unemployment right now. So everybody's basically in a job, but making sure that we understand what you're doing, what you're looking for in the future, how to best partner with you and not just trying to find your job and place you in it, but really being a partner in the long run. So definitely appreciate coming out, um, meeting everybody. Um, if you know, you're know you interested in having a point of contact or learning more about you know, the market trends or even maybe looking for your next opportunity, feel free to come up to me. I have some cards out there as well. Um, but definitely you know, appreciate having having it out. So thank you very much. That's kind of how I should feel. Thank you. And uh, that's when we have Nick come up talk about Rev3. You know, so if, if anybody has any, any ideas, you know, they want to start, they want to start a company, especially in the manufacturing space. I mean, you know, contact, reach out to Nick. You know, the, you know they, they can they can get you set up this meeting space and 
Nick will tell you all about it. <laughs> Thanks, Joel. Uh, hi, guys. So my name is Nick Zeta. I work for DuPage County. I do business development here, uh, all 39 cities in DuPage. And as a result of that, I run Rev3. So we're a co-working space and uh, business incubator, like Joel said. Actually, uh, last Monday night, June 1st, we celebrated our six-month anniversary, which is pretty exciting. Um, as of two weeks ago, we have 23 member companies in the space now. Um, two of our most recent ones are pretty exciting. We have a startup uh, in the med tech space. Um, for medical testing uh, applications. They got some VC money out of Boston, and uh, they're gonna have about seven full-time uh, developers located here. And then our second most recent company is a manufacturing firm from Bloomingdale. Uh, they took a corner office in the back. They have a couple CNC's in there, and they brought in some 3D printers of their own, along with some money uh, that we've been, uh, we've been donated uh, specifically to build out an electronics lab. Um, so tech and uh, rapid prototyping is what we're trying to build, as Joel said. Um, if you, you or you know anyone who needs, uh, you know, just kind of open freelance space or co-working space or meeting space, um, let me know. I have orange flyers and, and cards in the back and I'm always happy to host the group. So thank you, Joel. All right. And then, uh, so that, all the instructions are done. So we're just going to get right into let, 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 let right. start, start, start doing a speech. <coughs> You thought the introductions were done, but it would be it's kind of weird if I didn't give one. Um, <coughs> lots about me up there. Uh, you can read, so I won't repeat. Um, today, I, I don't really want to talk about Scrum so much. I, I figure most people who want to give up a Sunday afternoon, <coughs> rainy or not, um, to come to a talk with this title probably are familiar with Scrum already, so that's not so interesting. What I want to talk about is how do we move beyond checking the boxes that say, yeah, we're doing Scrum and turn it into something successful, something sustainable? Um, it's also probably a little more appropriate to this group, right? It's what's common to everybody here, developing software. Uh, I know I've only got your attention for a reasonably short amount of time, so I'm going to introduce a lot of topics. I'm not going to get real in depth on, on many of them. Um, I will do my quick plug here and I'll try and keep it out after this. I have a 40 hour version of this through the Scrum Alliance, the Certified Scrum Developer course. Very, very detailed, very hands-on, lots of coding exercises, collaborative things. If you want to know if it's any good, go find Capel outside and talk to him. Uh, he's been in it. Uh, but everything that we talk about today um, is at least worked through in, in some regards through there. Um, If it's been a while since you looked at the Agile Manifesto, I don't, I don't blame you. Um, it's only a few sentences long, right? So there's not a whole lot that you need to refer to it for, but there's all these principles <coughs> behind it. The, the reason I like to use this slide is I don't think people have a good understanding of the background of the Agile Manifesto. Uh, when we talk about Agile and we talk about Scrum, a lot of people think, oh, it's very processy. It's kind of like, oh, we take our PMs and PMPs and we send them to a two-day CSM course and now, ooh, we're Agile, right? And that ain't it at all. Right? You go back to the original conferences and you look at who was there. Most of those guys were software practitioners, right? And as a result, if you start to look at these, about half, now I could stretch it and say more, um, but about half of the 12 principles are directly about software creation, right? They're about development practices. And there's a reason for that. One is because it's things they cared about, but two, didn't think you could be successful without following them. Now it's odd when you go and look at, you know, the Scrum Handbook or something like this that doesn't talk about that stuff too much, and we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, but if you go and you learn Scrum basics, or you go into an organization that's doing Scrum, and they can't hit all of the topics we're talking about today, even to a point where they just say, yeah, we know it, and we've decided to do X and not Y, and here's why, there's probably an issue. I would challenge you guys to be able to bring those discussions to bear. So. I would put all the things that I want to chat about in, into the bucket of Agile engineering practices. Sort of a loaded term. Uh, we could choose a lot of different ways to define it, but I'm going to give you a sort of dictionary-like 
definition. Because it's a collection of things, um, a lot of them are, are optional, right? They're best practices, uh, but almost any set of them that you choose to take is going to be better than not picking any. I mentioned a few minutes ago that you go read the Scrum Handbook, it doesn't tell us very much about these. They'll say some things like, oh yeah, take uh, competent, motivated individuals who know what they're doing and sort of let them loose. And they'll figure it out. That's great, assuming you've got competent, motivated individuals who know what's best for the product. But if you don't, you get chaos, right? You get crappy software and crappy environments. So Scrum doesn't tell us what to use because it's not a methodology. It's a framework. It's a way of going about building products. Um, technically, you can use Scrum on lots of things that have nothing to do with software. I have used it on non-software products, and it's gone fine. Right, but when you start to add practices to a framework, you get a methodology. Now this means the way that I might do Scrum and the way you might do Scrum could be totally different. We could both be doing Scrum and that's sort of confusing. But it's okay, it's not the end of the world. Uh, if only there was this principle called metaphor where we would have common definitions of things, that would be really handy. But anyway, there we are. It's difficult to make hard and fast rules about this stuff because it's situational dependent. We want to fill up a toolbox, right? Just like at home, I'm not the world's handiest guy. I'm pleased today that my wife is not with us or there would be snickering from the back of the room. Um, but I have a toolbox and it has a lot of tools in it. Now, a fool with a tool is still a fool. Right, I can get a bunch of tools, but if I don't know how to use them and when to pick the right ones, it doesn't work out so well for me. What I'm trying to do today is introduce you guys to the tools and hopefully inspire you to figure out the right times to use them. Now, it's important to say that this is all point in time dependent. I know you guys had, had Uncle Bob come in, he probably ran you guys through some, some history lesson, right? I'm not going to run you through that history lesson one because I don't have time and you've already heard it, but the point is a lot of the success that comes in good software development comes from an understanding not only the needs of your product, but the point in time in which you're developing. Each of these things over here had very different architectural standards, they had very different technical practices, they had different recommendations of things to do and not to do. And they ought to, right? Good architecture should be a product of its time. It should reflect the circumstances that we're developing in. So we can come up with lots of definitions of architecture, but I like structured use cases and I like realized intent. If you think about those two things, anytime our use cases change, anytime our intent changes, probably the rest is going to fall with it. Now that's sort of irritating when you make your living teaching architecture courses because it means that I gotta keep changing it. And the stuff that I teach people to do today, I probably won't teach them 10 years from now. I might not teach them five years from now, right? And hopefully that's not because I get hit by a truck. It's because interesting things happen make me change my advice. This next slide here, this is a topic we could spend a lot, a lot of time on. Um, the technology roadmap and the sort of use of our product is a big sort of thinking point for where we need to make changes and what kinds of practices we want to follow, but so is the maturity of our product, right? So, got a handy picture of Uncle Bob looking mildly, I don't know. Terrifying. Um, better than, than some of the silly pictures you generally see of him. Um, and, and he's up there because these principles come from him. Um, these are the, the principles of component cohesion and component coupling. And they have a lot to do with how we hook our application together, right? Where do we draw the, the boundaries between DLLs and jars, right? And how do we decide what to shove into which one? And, 
how do we wrap maintenance cycles around them? Uh, again, it's a very detailed subject. Uh, I recommend you look it up or you come talk to me some other time. But uh, the point is, there's not just the right answer to say, oh, if you are doing a client server app in .NET 4, you're going to pick this one and this one and kind of throw this one to the side. It's not the way it works. It really works more like a tension diagram. So just in, just in cohesion here, you can imagine this you know, to say, okay, we have some, some principles of cohesion and a kind of problem that we solve you know, on the vertex across. Just like no application is fully solid, I'm sure you guys have figured that out by now, no application is going to fully adhere to any of these three things, right? A component up at the top like this, well, it's going to be really, really reusable. That's fantastic, right? Uh, but it's pretty far away from common reuse. It's pretty far away from common closure. So who knows what's in it? Right? Are the right things in it? Uh, I don't know. Down at the, the other side, rather than being all bloated, right, rather than affecting everybody, it might only change for one reason. It might be too small to be worth maintaining. Now that's, again, maybe okay. But once you realize where an application sits in here, whether it's your own or somebody else's, you start to realize, hopefully, what's important to the people who produce that. When I develop an application, imagine this. Let's say you're doing .NET. And you go import a library that has, you know, we'll call it bloated. You know, something like membership provider has thousand things in it. You're like, well, those guys are crappy coders, right? They don't follow any of these principles. No. No, they've just realized that uh, release reuse is much more important to them. It's mature. It's not changing anymore. It's not so volatile. And they don't want to go through a certain amount of life cycle management on it anymore. So they move stuff together. But what my code that uses it at the very beginning of development, I expect to have lots of changes probably going to be much more concerned about being down here. But as I grow, I might start to shove stuff together. I might start changing it. This is true not only for the way I divide up my application, but for the practices I want to follow. Um, whether that is a processing practice, like pair programming, for instance, you know, which is sort of a, a hot topic for some people. Um, whether it is you know, sort of my handling of technical debt, right? Different points in my life cycle and different points in the technology's life cycle and the product's life cycle are all going to affect these things. There's a way to frame that. If you guys have ever seen Dean Leffingwell's uh, Scaled Agile Framework, um, Dean invented these principles of agile architecture. There's seven now. At one point there were eight, then he cut it down to six, and moved it back up to seven. I think it'll probably stay there. Um, basically, this, this is just a restatement of principle 11 from the Agile Manifesto, and it's pretty hard to go wrong when you base your thing on the actual <coughs> Agile Manifesto, but There's a balance here, right? And it looks like this. I didn't make this graph, Dean did. I want to have fast and local control of my design so I can embrace change, right? At the same time, I can't be chaos. If I'm going to be one small component in a giant application to which I have to integrate that then integrates that then integrates that then integrates, and all of a sudden, I probably need to have some sort of framework around that, right? So I don't want to future-proof, right? I don't want to start to design things that I can't back out of later. 
but I need to think about what are the decisions that impact me in a major way and where are my places where I can have some freedom. But APIs are a great example of that. Do a reasonably good job defining your API and maybe putting some versioning on that API and inside it you can do whatever you need to. I'm not going to go through all the seven principles because we don't have time, but they all sort of follow this same approach to thinking about points in time. System size affects runway length. Uh, architectural runways, that's principle two of, of Left and Wheels Agile architecture. There's architectural flow, or just like a, a product backlog. You get ideas, you think about them, you vet them, you groom them, you throw them out, or you slay them for implementation, right? That's principle seven. You build the simplest thing that could possibly work up until the last responsible moment. It's a, a trickier discussion, but as your application grows and your needs change, the right decision, right, the, the right definition of could possibly work is probably gonna alter as well. When you think about how you put those things together, right? So we've talked a little bit about how you assemble your application at the end, but how did you get to that point? Well, in my mind, this is, this is sort of my everyday practice list, right? The stuff that I, I pretty much don't compromise on. There are very few cases where I don't want to follow all of these. Uh, or, or at least be able to have a discussion about their utilization in my projects. It, it's the price of admission to creating software in an agile manner. Now this looks a lot like XP. Well, this is XP, right? But why talk about that in Scrum? You can find some really ugly graphs of the XP practices, but I like this one because it's got these three concentric circles that sort of align the practices to different concerns. And when you look at the red circle, the outermost circle, it starts to look a lot like Scrum. Uh, oh, we got a whole team and we plan together in this funny game and uh, we release iteratively, incrementally, frequently, and we make sure our customers are involved. Oh, well, that's, that's an awful lot like Scrum, isn't it? So if that's our wrapper, then what we put inside should be up to us. It gives us a lot of freedom to make terrible choices or to make really good choices. I recommend that we not make terrible choices, but it's up to us. Now, XP itself, um, and if you haven't figured it out, I'm a pretty big extreme programming fan. Um, it shares a lot of values with Scrum. If you, if you look at that list up there and you do a quick Google search, if you're not familiar with the five values, right, you see a fair amount of overlap there. <coughs> XP itself was actually the thing that was most strongly represented at the original manifesto meetings. Uh, you know, so Kent Back, Ward Cunningham, Martin Fowler, Ron Jeffries, these are big XP luminaries. Only 17 original signatories. Jeff and Ken from Scrum, it's two. Right? You want to count in Uncle Bob as an XP guy now, probably. Well, it's five of the 17 right there. It's important. Can you be agile without them? Yeah. But probably not for very long. So, Jeff Sutherland has even said this quote here. In the interest of embracing simplicity and, and trying to keep a product development framework as simple as possible, they're never going to make it a mandatory part of Scrum. They really, really like it. Because it works. Right? It does all the things you need it to do. Now some of these practices are good in and of themselves, but others are good for what they give us. 
Now, you've probably heard of SOLID. The acronym of acronyms is you know, so popular. So, SOLID makes code easy to test. It makes it easy to maintain. It makes it easy to grow. All things that are pretty important if you're going to try and embrace change and you know, release frequently, that kind of thing. Well, it pairs really nicely with test-driven development, too. TDD uh, done with a thought towards solid makes it really easy to get too solid quickly. Um, and it sort of builds in a mental step in the process where you're like, ooh, am I where I want to be? Right? So they, they start to have some synergy in all these practices and processes. You need to think about what are the goals that I have for this application? What are the things that I need to get done to call it a success? And then what are the practices that allow me to work backwards that would strongly, strongly recommend solid be the answer to that? At least a big part of the answer. Now, there are circumstances where I would change that advice, but they're pretty small. They're, they're not normal. That being said, think. Well, I, I have done some terrible things um, in the name of following rules over thinking. Right? It generally doesn't work out very well for you. I don't want to say that I don't care if you violate these principles, because I sort of do. I hope you care if you're violating them, but more than that, I hope that you have an awareness that you're doing it, and a good reason for it. Good reasons will emerge. You don't want to follow a single responsibility? Well, okay. Maybe you're following the state pattern. You're implementing state. And you know what? You can't follow both of those. State object's got to do whatever it does and return the next state. That's two responsibilities. Oh, God, no, we can never use state in an agile application. That's stupid. Don't do that, right? Use your brain. If you have a violating class, but it has private fields and, and nobody's going to use it, right? Feel free to have that sort of trade-off thought and that discussion with your team. Um, it's open close, right? If you've got a switch statement and you feel like you've covered 100% of the possible cases and those are never going to change and you feel that it makes the code more readable, I'm not going to come to your house and burn it down because you didn't follow open close, right? I might say, are you aware of the risks that you're taking on by that? Yeah. It's a dependency inversion, you can have a single use workflow, right? And a single component and you feel that it helps you more tightly adhere to other principles, it could be the case. We can come up with, with instances where blindly following things is just as stupid as not following them at all. I mentioned state. Um, if you aren't able to talk about your application and think about your application in terms of the patterns that make it up, it's probably not a great thing. So there's one of two possible scenarios. That one you just don't know patterns. Great, cool. Lots of benefits to knowing them, right? Fill up your toolbox, introduce metaphor, be able to you know, uh, look for known solutions to problems as they arise. But if you know patterns and you can't describe your application in any patterns, that sounds an awful lot like you're trying to reinvent the wheel. Frankly, there aren't that many new problems. You can also reduce confusion pretty considerable amount when you start to have these almost template solutions to work off of. You start to tell me that, you know, oh, I've got this thing that's, you know, state aware and everybody registers with it and then when an action happens and it broadcasts a message and everybody who's registered with it will receive a copy of the message and it's just asynchronous. Stop! You're already boring me to tears. 
we could have described that in three words, right? And if we would have, there wouldn't have been any misunderstanding because you choose to call something, one of those things, slightly different than I did, and now all of a sudden we're off track. Uh, a good example of that is when you're talking about model view controller. This comes up a lot, right? MVC is a pattern, it's a very old pattern, uh, but the design pattern that exists is very different than the thing that Microsoft gives you if you're doing .NET development and what a controller object does versus, okay. So try and avoid those, those kinds of ambiguities and, and mass confusion. Um, you could spend lots and lots of your life learning about patterns. Um, that being said, just like anything else, don't have some golden hammer go be like, holy cow, I learned about strategy and now everything's strategy pattern. No, no, no. You know, I'm gonna factory out my hello world and abstract a message and then I'm gonna create a response. Uh, no, don't do those things. Um, Gang of Four is a good place to start, right? Creational, structural, behavioral patterns, any of that. They're not the end of it by any means. There's lots of patterns that I like, that I recommend, that have nothing to do with the Gang of Four, uh, but they're a good place to start. This is not my chart either. This comes from IBM. Now interestingly though, it has uh, an R squared value of 0 0.972. Stats classes, I mean, it's it pretty accurate. Fixing problems in production is about 40 times the cost of fixing them in design. Big surprise. Well, it's harder to fix something you've implemented than fixing something you've only thought about. Getting that quality right at the beginning is a much better idea. And it gives you all these benefits. Right, lower maintenance and uh, less time. Although that's that's a tricky thing. People don't think that necessarily. Reduce defects and, and better traceability. Lots and lots of companies use it. In fact, over half of global Fortune 500 companies are using test-driven development in at least one division. So there's another good reason to get good at test-driven development is you'll get a better job sometimes. Frankly, if you work in, in a shop that refuses to do test-driven development, you're probably going to want a better job soon. Now, I said point two, that you develop simpler code in less time, and that is um, a reasonably new statement. Now, back when, when TDD was first written about in an academic setting, there was this belief that, oh yeah, it's good, but it takes long. In some cases, it might be tests over no tests take longer, right? Uh, or it could be the coverage was very, very different. But there was still this thought um, that it would go up quite a bit, original implementation time, and that made it hard to sell. Everybody was worried about time to market versus total cost of ownership, and where do you draw the lines, and how do you make those decisions? Um, IBM did a couple of studies, Microsoft did a couple of studies, I can point them out to you at other times. Uh, 2008, there was, there was sort of a hallmark study that said, ooh, maybe it's, maybe it's actually faster. 2010, it got confirmed. Um, Microsoft actually changed their mind on that too, and at one point they said it took 15 to 30% longer and about eight years later, they said it actually takes 15% less time. So, but it all comes to the cost of refactoring. Test-driven development does not mean write a test, write some code, ship it, right? There's a surprising number of people who do TDD really poorly. Um, Still some benefits to doing it, even if you do it poorly. Um, 
but not very many. And, and doing it well is a much better idea. So refactoring is also not bug fixing. Refactoring, it's up there. Now, I'm not looking for people to get smart with me and telling me that anytime you make a code change, you're changing behavior at like the instruction level in assembly because you might get stabbed in the eye if you start an argument like that with me. I'm talking about observable behavior. Yeah, I've got a pen or something around here. I don't, I'm not messing around. <laughs> change form without changing function. So George Dinwiddie uh, used to have this hat. I think Uncle Bob since adopted it. George doesn't wear it very much anymore. <laughs> And I like this hat as a learning exercise, also because it, it points out who doesn't know TDD very well, and, and you can ridicule really them until they get it right. No, um, red, green, refactor, right? And you point it out, and you can only ever be in one state at a time. Don't be trying to move the hat halfway and say, I'm going to kind of make a test while I refactor this. Oh, nope, stop, right? One thing at a time. Refactoring is so important, um, it, it's very hard for me to overstate how much it's worth your time to really, all right, uh, I'll make this statement. If I had time to learn one thing, I'd get better at refactoring patterns before I got better at design patterns, right? Now. Design patterns are, are great. He like said refactoring patterns are um, tricky. Refactoring patterns are probably the best example of use your brain, come up with the right solution. Um, so Martin Fowler listed about 75 refactoring patterns. Uh, Josh Karevsky's got another 40 something. Um, James Carr's got an entity pattern catalog. I'm not saying go out and memorize them all, but get to a point where you're understanding the thought processes and what you're looking for. Uh, now, there's a lot of good reasons to that. You could take my word for it, which would be handy since you guys brought me here, but, but you don't have to. You could also see for yourselves that as time evolves, right, as our application evolves, our architecture emerges. I don't want to think about the final form of my application on day one. I'm already starting to code myself into a box. And then all of a sudden, some sales guy wants to take a three second honeymoon in Hawaii, and he goes on and sells something ludicrously different than what we imagined this application as. You know, i got to get it done. And I say, well, yeah, I was developing Agile, but to a specification, you can't go change the specification a lot. Then, right? It's a sort of eye stabbing situation. Don't put yourself into that. If you're really developing, um, you know, in a simple way, you're following Yagni or you ain't going to need it, you're not putting stuff in until it's proven that you needed to, well, Minimal code is functional code. Functional code is not always optimal. I can write a calculator that adds two numbers, right? When I first start that, I put, you know, a test for one and one, return two. Put it on the second test, one and two, or return three. Well, at what point should I start to maybe abstract that with right? It's a stupidly simple example. But minimum code to do one task is probably not the minimum code to do the next task. Hopefully it's not, right? And you may have to go change that earlier code in order to support that activity. Probably it makes it more maintainable as well. Uh, you're going to find well-known solutions as you start to get into new spaces. Now, sometimes those will sneak up on you and other times you'll know they're coming. Sometimes you'll be like, huh, 
just looks an awful lot like a bridge pattern. Not quite time for it. But I see when I get to this thing, I'm going to have to make a change. Jump the gun, wait for it, right? But it's good to understand that those things are coming. The last reason to refactor is by just looking at the code with a critical eye. Just looking at it beyond our sort of, hey, it's time for a code review. Yeah, 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 we all got stuff to do. Does your code work? You got good coverage? All your tests pass? Great. Check. A refractoring eye starts to find problems, right? It starts to find code smells. Now, it's worth list knowing, uh, knowing a good list of typical code smells. Uh, so, this this cycles for a bit here, and it's by no means exhaustive. And one of the handouts I give in my course is a a matrix of refactoring patterns to code smells, right? And we, we kind of work through, all right, here's one code smell, what are our five different approaches to do it, and how would you, you choose it, right? I've been bitten in an application by probably two-thirds of those at some point in time that I wished I wasn't, so I'm a pretty strong believer in them. If you feel like you're good at, at TDD, or, or maybe you're, you're skeptical because you think there's too many reasons, too many situations where you can't apply it, my response is to that situation is you don't know enough about test-driven development. And if you think you're really good at it, uh, which is fantastic, I hope that's true, uh, then I hope you can have an intelligent discussion about things like, like this. How do you introduce test-driven development to a legacy application? Something that doesn't have any tests. Right. What's the, the approach to bug fixing? How do you do data-driven and integration testing? And at what point do you um, switch over from you know, unit testing to something a little more oomphy, right? Um, what happens when your logic's in a database, in a stored procedure? I mean, we shouldn't use stored procedures anymore. Right? How do you handle UI testing, external systems, black boxes, private methods, right? All of these things are important to have a, a good, solid approach to. Um, I'm not going to get very far with those in the next 19 minutes, but, but you should, and you've got longer than 19 minutes. You've got the rest of your career to get good at it. So, Test-driven development um, is often thought of being great for writing new applications. That's true. I would say, uh, in my career, the majority of projects I've worked on have not been Greenfield, right? We we'll very rarely just come up with a, a great idea and a bucket full of money and then tell you to go run. It happens sometimes, and I'm always pleased when it does. But that's not generally the world I'm operating in. And even if it is, the first time I forget to do some tests or I have a production bug and, and it's rolled out, I'm going to care about these things anyway. So rather than treating them like exceptions in my process, it should probably be central, right? Uh, the things that you should be able to speak confidently about. Some of that comes from good test doubling, too. Um, I, I would say to choose based on, on the practice, right? If you're doing behavioral driven or, or acceptance test driven te um, development, your approach to this might be slightly different than, than if you're not, depending on your application architecture. The, the sort of test levels that you may choose to use could be very different. Um, there's impact, right? Any kind of object that stands in for another one, we could call a test double. Uh, but how much time and effort are you spending on implementing them? And then once you're doing them, are you maintaining those, right? Hopefully you treat your tests as important as production code. It's a hard thing to do, I know that. But especially as you move up towards fakes where you've got actual implementation somewhere, 
and loses its value pretty quickly if it's not maintained. Just on the off chance that there's some people in this room who uh, have not spent a lot of time with doubles, I do want to run through them very quickly because I feel like uh, it, it's difficult to make the decision where and what to use and how to use if you don't have a good understanding of the fundamentals. And in some people's experience, this is pretty fundamental, and other times it's totally new. So I'm always amazed by the, the kind of responses I get there and the range. So let's spend just a, a couple minutes on, on test doubles. So we've got dummies, right? A, a dummy doesn't add very much to it at all, uh, and, and that's okay. When I start to write a, a test, you know, very likely I'll, I'll follow this approach at first. Uh, stubs get a, a little more implemented unless you're doing a void, in which case there's nothing to it, right? A uh, uh, stub and dummy are the same thing because it's just doing a hard code return, basically. There are people out there who might argue with the definition of spy as a test double, um, a little bit more as a debugging technique or something, which, yeah, I don't care. We can have that argument. I'd rather have it than no argument at all. Um, but if you are trying to, to learn some things about the, the state of your application, uh, as another pitch here, if you're doing good test-driven development, you probably won't use spies very often because pretty much never need a debugger in a TDD application. I know my code was working a minute ago. I know exactly what I'm working on and how I got there. And hopefully I'm you know, mocking the state up to what I need in order to make you know, that one unit run. Buggers generally aren't that, that helpful to me. So generally spies become less helpful to me too, but not all. Got fakes, right? Throwaway implementations. Um, that's real helpful if you have slow running tests and things, right? Uh, and then, then we have our mocks to replace the whole system. Now, big difference between a stub and a mock uh, is they, they can look very similar to some people. It's what they're verifying, right? Stubs are allowing you to do state verification. Mocks are, are behavioral. Uh, you could maybe blend the difference with a spy depending on uh, where you chose to, to stop your implementation there. But if you're doing behavioral driven development, you want to mock basically everything. If you're doing test driven development the way Kent Beckmore kind of originally wrote about it, you're not going to want to use doubles at all. Good luck with that. Um, I think even now um, they would probably, well, I know Ron Jeffries has backed down off of that, uh, but again, understand what's important to you and, and where you can draw the lines as things like processor resources uh, scale up and the amount of memory that we have available to us as programmers increases dramatically, I start to become less interested in things. Not always, but I'd probably rather learn more about my application and get increased confidence than deal with a possible constraint that